I stay bout it, I'm not pouting Break through walls and climb it mountains If you want it, scream it loud And show this world what they've been doubting Never waiting on the world to catch up to me Leave it in the rear view I wish that it was up to me The world would never fit Okay, welcome to another episode of the Brain Tainment Show. Today, I'm really fortunate to be joined by Dr. Nesh Nikolic, uh, who I came across on YouTube originally uh, as host of the Better Thinking podcast, which we'll talk a little bit about on today. Um, but more so, uh, more to the point, I should say, Nesh is a clinical psychologist based in Canberra with well over 15,000 hours of one-on-one therapy experience uh, and is trained in a number of therapy models. His great therapeutic rep, uh, passion lies in utilizing acceptance and commitment therapy for his clients uh, and training clinicians all around Australia, which we're going to unpack today. Um, and I'm really excited to do so. Nesh's guest uh, lectured and provided all day workshops at the University of Canberra and has been invited to present at TEDx events held at the University of Western Sydney and Canberra. I mentioned the YouTube channel at the top there. Um, Nesh is host of the Better Thinking podcast, which is centered around conversations exploring practical applications of psychology in everyday life. And if you've been following the show for any amount of time, you know that that's the kind of conversations that I love to have. Um, so we're really fortunate today to be chatting with, with someone of Nesh's experience and calibre. So lots to get through. Um, with all that said, mate, welcome to the show, Nesh. Really appreciate it, Liam. It's uh, good to uh, talk about acceptance and commitment therapy. Anytime I get a, an invite, I'm always happy to do so because it's, it's certainly my passion. Well, just to give a snapshot and to provide some context, I suppose, um, I mean, psychology is a very broad, broad world and there's many different approaches. So talk to us a bit about the work that you do and I guess the impact that you're ultimately hoping to have. Sure. Look, psychology is extremely broad. What I practice is the the counselling side, if you will. So the therapy, sitting down, having a conversation with people, human beings about any of their challenges. Being a clinical psychologist means that I'm really given a, an incredible opportunity to speak with people from all walks of life with all sorts of challenges going on. And hitting pause, spending some time reflecting on what's happening for these people and in so many ways trying to decipher and pull apart and understand why they're feeling the way they're feeling, why they're thinking the way they're, they're, they're thinking and to be able to try and utilise strategies, approaches, perspectives to live a, a richer, more vibrant life. So it's the best job in the world. I'm basically having uh, coffees and cups of teas with, with people all day. Um, you know, I, I'd encourage lots of others to, to, to join the, you know, the, the psychology industry because it's, it's fantastic and it's very rewarding too. I can only imagine. Um, and I'd, I'd love to know, how did you end up in this space? So just to kind of digress for a moment, you know, um, I'm just for myself personally scratching the surface of this world and understanding, you know, um, humans and and how we operate and, and how I can help myself and of course then be able to help others primarily off the back of some of my own personal challenges. But I don't know a lot about your story. So maybe just give us the highlights reel of how you end up in this space. Was that something you were always interested in? How did you, how did you get here? Gosh, well, my, my, my story goes back uh, some time ago when I was a training to be a mechanic in the army and I went to a number of personal development courses, people like, you know, the Anthony Robbins type of um, uh, performers, if you will. And that really kind of blew my mind to tell you the truth that they were introducing ideas, topics, uh, viewpoints that I'd never heard. Obviously, I was a young man and, and, and it kind of, um, you know, impressed upon me some really interesting spaces. And so I decided to make a bit of a change and uh, I thought, what, what's the most, uh, what's the best way to go out and share some of this information with the wider population? It's kind of like, you know, those that have changed want, want to change others scenario. Uh, thankfully, I, I chose psychology, thinking that it would give me the greatest breadth of of um, opportunity to speak with others. And so, I was very fortunate to have guessed right. And uh, I think what 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 happened is I found out in my studies and and obviously uh, our education and research that many of the things that were being said in these incredible um, programs weren't quite 
what they claim to be. And that made me very, very passionate about obviously the evidence-based approach of, you know, putting science uh, to, to these claims. And as, as I sort of um, progressed through, I saw certain things that, that I'd learned were, were valid and other things were um, hocus pocus, uh, pretty, pretty uh, bold and uh, wacky claims. And so, you know, that, 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 that gave me even greater um, a passion in, in the world of psychology. And, and I, I felt a, you know, part of my, my, my job is to make sure that a wider population can, can understand psychological um, appreciations, uh, learnings, understandings, research, uh, rather than hopefully, you know, going to a, a self-help book uh, that has great, great claims. And so when I first bumped into acceptance and commitment therapy, which is my, my uh, um, you know, great, great, great passion in, in psychology, it really resonated with me and it had a very strong uh, evidence base to it. And so uh, it's been dubbed like a third wave of CBT. Uh, and in, in so many ways, it doesn't really matter what we call it. It, it, it It's sound. Uh, we know that the value set is, is immense uh, and it's demonstrated to be able to work with human beings across all presentations. So rather than going out and saying that a client, you know, presents with a disorder, um, a client presents with a story, with a context. And if we can understand the story and the context, there will be no dispute uh, because, you know, the, the way I always talk about it is uh, if a client, if a person sees a hundred psychologists, uh, if we then interview the psychologist and say, tell me what's happening for this person, all hundred will effectively tell the same story about the context, where the stressors are coming from, uh, why it's upsetting them and the like. But if we then ask them, what diagnosis do they, um, well, you know, would they, would they provide, would they give, you'd see variability. And that's what is, is mind boggling to, mm. to me. And I think ACT or Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, the, um, the called and brief ACT, uh, does not care for labeling. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think any, any therapy cares for labeling. Uh, we're trying to drop the judgment and, and more so look at the context in being able to help people. So if it's one of your primary roles then to, is it, is, is it listening to the story and trying to identify um, where you can help early in the piece and then providing some information you're talking about that's, you know, science and evidence-based, is it entirely just um, allowing someone to talk out loud to essentially even just, join the dots in their own mind as they start to articulate, is there kind of a one best way approach or is it um, entirely contextual based on the, the person that you see in terms of what they present with, um, you know, their history, things of that nature? Is there a one best way? Look, there, there, there isn't. It is absolutely, as you say, entirely contextual. Uh, and that's what therapy is. It's meeting a client at a space that they need to be met and understanding that you know there are plenty of times where a client purely through verbalizing their thoughts uh it, it's not uncommon for someone to stop mid-sentence and to comment about their own thought and saying this is sounding really uh, minor now that i'm saying it and what what they're effectively saying is now that i've heard it out aloud i'm putting it into context but while it was in my head going round and round, doing, you know, thousands of mental miles every day. Uh, it wasn't in context or the context was that it was serious and it was, you know, urgent and I needed to panic and the like. Mm. So sometimes it's quite cathartic or we get to join the dots as we go along by purely talking about it. But what's interesting is in therapy, while you're talking about these things, you're not being judged. And there's very few contexts that, we can go out and do that. And this is what's kind of bizarre. Now, that, that, that's not the whole of psychology, but interestingly, part of psychology allows for that. Mm. And so part of what people are wanting to, to uh, why they're wanting to engage with a psychologist is so that they can go out and think without judgment, you know, that they're, they're some, with someone who's going to be objective, mm. uh, they're not going to be, you know, involved in the story, although they can still be compassionate. 
caring, thoughtful, you know, and considerate. Uh, the other side of that, you know, might be where a psychologist helps to highlight or shine a torch into areas that a client may not have observed or seen or the like. And so a classic space that we can shine a torch to for a lot of people is this place of avoidance. So, you know, human beings have many unwanted thoughts and many unwanted feelings. And what's incredible is that we have a natural bias or a natural response to say, get rid of anything that's painful, get rid of anything that's unwanted, push it away. Now, interestingly, if, if I were to put my hand on, let's say, a hot stove, I immediately move my hand away because it's unwanted, it's a burn. Uh, but that's almost instinctual. We don't even have to think about it. When I have a painful emotion, the same thing can occur yet it's only happening inside me. And so now I'm needing to learn how to live inside my skin. It could be a painful thought and we might avoid that too. Now, if we can't identify painful thoughts, painful emotions, uh, painful feelings, sensations, memories, images, uh, belief systems, if we can't identify them, then we're constantly running away from these, maybe being impulsive, being avoidant, being you know, frightened, scared, etc., And we might not be therefore going in the direction of life that we would like to, but rather being pushed around. Mm. Well, then let's talk a bit more about the, the ACT that you mentioned, the acceptance and commitment therapy. Tell us a bit more about what that looks like. I've heard you talk about previously from some of your content, I think it was the Hexaflex from memory. Um, so essentially some pillars that, that constitute that style uh, of therapy. Um, could you give, give us the snapshot of what that looks like? Um, I think it'd be really helpful. Sure. So ACT is split up somewhat into three sections. One is obviously the acceptance, you know, acceptance and commitment therapy. There's acceptance on one side. There is commitment. This is kind of like the driven action, moving forward, doing something deliberately. And then in the middle is mindfulness. So being present, being conscious, being aware. Yeah. Uh, on the left-hand side of the hexaflex, so the, it's a general model that ACT clinicians use. Uh, on the left-hand side is what we call the acceptance side. And so we're really trying to foster and develop an approach or a relationship with thoughts and feelings that uh, we experience inside our skin uh, to hold them in a gentler way without being pushed around, like what I was talking about a minute ago. So uh, there's a particular type of uh, approach called diffusion, and it, it, it's really helping uh, a person being able to identify that there's a stream of thoughts that are occurring in, any, in everybody. And it's just an observable truth that psychology can, can, can see. Now, we have these thoughts which you know, are a stream. They, they're, they're coming in almost like a thought factory. They're just showing up, coming up. And sometimes what we do is we use the information in a way that's truthful, meaning we are trying to see is it true or is it false? Is it right or is it wrong? There's like a judgment that's placed on it. And by virtue of... Uh, trying to figure out, is this true? Is it false? What should I do with this? We get involved with the thought. And so now that thought can, in some sense, kind of argue with us or it can push against us. It can get into a, you know, a conversation with us. And so we get involved in the, um, the ins and outs, all the bits and pieces of whatever the content is. So an example might be, let's say as a young person, I could have a thought, nobody likes me. Now, I can argue that and say, well, yes, I do. I have friends. But very quickly, a thought might pop into my mind, which says, but Peter didn't go out and invite me to his party. And once again, I can try and have a rebuttal and say, but maybe he's just forgotten and he's going to. The mind can come back immediately with, uh, I don't think so. You're not really a good friend. 
Now, it's never really nice like that. Like I've described it as though we're taking turns and we're having a very reasonable conversation. The mind, the thought factory does not care to take turns. And so it can just go out and blast me with all these reasons and, you know, have a crack at all the different traits and, you know, personality problems I have and my appearance and whether I'm popular or not, what it's going to mean for the rest of my life and, you know, press my buttons. Mm. Well, ACT does not care or diffusion, my apologies, does not care to do that. What it says is let's identify the thoughts and maybe even consider is it a new thought or is it an old thought? Is this a repetitive thought? And is it even a helpful thought? And so I might be able to somewhat change that equation moving from uh, nobody likes me to I'm having the thought nobody likes me. And so if you see there's a little bit of distance between those two, you know, mm. nobody likes me, it's a strong statement, that could be quite upselling, upsetting for a young person or even a, an adult. Mm. I'm having the thought nobody likes me there's distance we've diffused so we've separated ourselves from the content it's so less it's a potent. difference between, yeah less mm. potent less power absolutely so what happens is i see the world uh, uh no longer from the thought but rather see the thought and so if i'm seeing from the thought it's like putting glasses on that say nobody likes me and i'll find all the evidence for it Mm. But if I can see the thought, maybe I can relate to it differently. Now, similarly, we might do that with the way that we feel. We make space for those feelings so that they don't push us around and we adopt a, play, a position of acceptance or sit with, make room for, you know, come to terms with. So that's acceptance side. The, the commitment side is very simple. That's where we try and identify what's important, you know, who and what's important and act in accordance with that. But no, it's no longer just like I'm going to try. It's a committed action. So we mm. commit, you know, there's a bit more force behind it, uh, you know, with, with a bit of determination or maybe I need to use some courage or some patience even. I commit to a set of actions uh, or uh, a, a style of action that's in line with my values, the who and what's important. So it might be being patient, because that's not an easy thing to do, but it could be also to be assertive, which sometimes looks, you know, a little bit different to, to the patient side. And so it's kind of understanding why do I want to act in a certain way? And obviously the mindfulness or the you know, present moment uh, that kind of sits in the middle of the uh, uh, hexaflex, once again, also allows us to be, to, to be present, to observe, to notice all of these things going on. And rather than getting caught up in the past or the future, to be able to sit in the present uh, and act from that space. You know, it's also very you know, helpful to, to be able to appreciate and, and uh, you know, acknowledge what's going on. And mm. so the very, very, very middle of the hexaflex or the model of, 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 of ACT is trying to foster a position of psychological flexibility. So that means uh, developing range in the way that I can respond. So being psychologically flexible allows me to both, uh, let's say, for example, um, provide support and guidance to my young daughter or daughters with uh, compassion, maybe with understanding, maybe with uh, frustration, maybe with a stern look, maybe with gentle communication, maybe with um, uh, knowledge uh, that I'm providing and many, many, many different, different versions because contextually mm. I need to have range because they're all going to be different at different times. Uh, I think and- range is, uh, is, is super crucial and that's the thing that I'm starting to kind of revel in a little bit more as I dive into my own journey, I suppose, um, and connect with different people on this show. There's so much there that uh, we, could, we could unpack, but certainly from like a broad scope, seems like a really good model um, to a dog. Because what I'm hearing, Nash, and correct me if I'm wrong, was a couple of things. Firstly, what I really like from that is, you know, the idea of um, 
dissociating or removing the power of the thought and having that as a focus, like your locus of control is more so around the relationship to the thoughts as opposed to the thoughts, because a lot are, I'm sure you'd agree, like they're quite automatic. And so if our measure of psychological well-being is the sheer, you know, volume or types of thoughts that come in from time to time, we might be in trouble. But I suppose the danger is if you follow that thought and it compounds and you attach emotion to it, you get it's easy to get clouded, right? So I like the idea of just really focusing on the relationship we have with these thoughts and being able to look at it from a distance. I think that's um, really empowering. And then just with the ACT model in general, it sounds like there's a really nice, uh, it's funny, I was having some conversations this morning with a few friends talking about life being a game of nuance and it's, it's become my favorite word. And it seems like there's a bit of, well, you highlight the importance of acceptance, which is, I guess, a, more, a slightly more passive approach, but really important. And then you've also got the commitment, the doing, the which for me, I get, I already envision a sense of pride that comes from the action that's being taken. So you're also ticking that box. Is that kind of a fair assessment um, of what you've just uh, explained there? Absolutely. Look, look there, there is a lot of nuance and I love that, that word as well, because even the, the acceptance side, it's not really passive you know we, we we can be quite active in accepting as a matter of fact to accept doesn't necessarily mean i like mm. it doesn't mean that i i enjoy having the experience it, it's really coming to terms with or, or actively thinking about what my expectations are in life and so yeah many people uh, don't believe especially in, in in today's world that they should feel certain feelings and they, they, they no longer accept them. So classic example is a young boy might go out and say, I don't feel well before uh, an important uh, football match. And these days, rather than uh, saying something like that's completely normal uh, and, you know, it's, it, it's reasonable to be nervous or apprehensive or, you know, have, have these nerves showing up sometimes people might replace that with a word called anxiety. And so now anxiety is a word that we kind of closely associate with a clinical problem or something that we shouldn't have. And so in, in, in this sort of space where immediately saying, I need to go out and manage my anxiety better, or I have to do stress management. Or, it's kind of like I'm opposing that immediately rather than saying, Hey, Rick, it's completely fine. This tells me that it's really important to you. Now, now let's get out in the field and be nervous and uh, do what we need to do, which is, you know, maybe we need to kick down the sideline and chase or remember to tackle and, you know, keep a grip on whoever and all this, you know, all the fancy uh, things that footballers do. Uh, so it's not uh, let's get rid of how you feel so you can play well. It's in actual fact, let's focus on committed action, playing well in the service of your teammates, competition, you know, determination, while we make space and room for that discomfort of nervousness. Mm. And, you know, these thoughts of, oh, gosh, you know, I'm going to stuff it up if I'm nervous. So in that example you gave, which is a great one, I fit, there's like a, um, it's based on the assumption that that person or that group or, those, or that team will be facilitating or encouraging of, you know, um, creating the right environment. But as we would both know, I imagine in, there's a lot of societal challenges that can be really confining for emotional range, I suppose. So what I'm finding is there's, I like to look at conversations around what we can do on a personal level. And then of course, this is a more broader societal level. It's ultimately some of the impact I want to have with this show, but it's, you know, part of my language, but it's a lot fucking harder to to do that at at scale. Um, so, what, just following on from that thread, what are some of the societal challenges that you see that um, well potentially wreaking warfare on our on our own psychology, or perhaps something just um, maybe not as dramatic, but having a uh, or causing some challenges to say the least. Anyway, uh, what sort of societal problems do you see in place at the moment? Look, one of the greatest challenges in, in society is that society is full of humans. And so human beings are judgmental. We'd like to label and judge and comment in almost a, you know, black and white fashion. You know, we, we, we know this, this is what psychology is being able to, to, to observe you know, forever. 
And part of the challenge here is, you know, in range, rather than something in black and white, we want it to be contextual. We want it to be gray. The issue is that when we use language, language is formulated with a whole lot of other ideas in mind. So uh, if I were to say, you know, how tall are you? Uh, you might, because you're an adult, just try and think of, oh, I'm 178 centimetres tall. But if I were to say to my daughter, how tall are you? Because she's six years old, she might immediately convert tall equals good. Because you want to be the tallest in your class, right? You also want to be the fastest in your class. You always want to be the, you know, the smartest or the most popular, whatever it is, right? So tall all of a sudden equals good. Now, if if I am tall or taller than you, and if tall is good, you are therefore deficient or bad. So human beings have this capacity to derive information where no information is present. Mm. And in there is the problem. We have this thing, you know, called relational frame theory, which underpins acceptance and commitment therapy, which is effectively the way that we place meaning and the way that we derive information. And so therapy is all about pulling apart the information that we've derived over time and what it means and hence why lots of people for example feel that they are a disappointment or not good enough uh, for their parents or they don't have their parents approval mm. the classic one right um, or you know friends approval or whatever it might be and so we are socially you know worried mm. uh, and that has a good forcing function don't get me wrong because it, it's really useful to be worried about what your peers think because it keeps us in line and it keeps things moving but if that gets carried away, if we get carried away with that, it can be incredibly debilitating. So I, I think what's the, the problem with society at the moment is a, is a lack of understanding, a lack of conversation that we're having today. And I'm probably saying that because I'm wildly biased because I love psychology and I love accepting commitment therapy. But uh, I genuinely think that that to be the case, you know, mm. with, with a greater understanding, uh, we won't get pushed around nearly as much as we presently do, you know, and, and still be able to function as human beings and, and, you know, pursue all the things that we love. Mate, I, I agree aggressively uh, with what, with that idea that, you know, these conversations need to um, be more um, penetrating to culture a lot more than they are currently, I suppose, is, is what I talk a lot about on this program anyway. Um, and when you add in some of the, some of the challenges like social media, which is ultimately just an amplifier. I don't think it's created anything new. It's just amplified this need for what you touched on there um, to please people, whether it's your parents or your friends. You know, it obviously creates a far more um, potent uh, comparison game um, and things of that nature. So I actually wanted to talk a little bit about, about comparison, where it comes from. You, you mentioned there, like, it's, like I just uh, touched on that, um, we often are seeking approval, you know, friends, family, things of that nature. Where does that yes. come from? Is that, um, you know, is that something that stems from childhood? Is that something that is um, created by a trauma? Where does that come from? I'm sure it's varied, but what do you see in your practice? Sure. Look, where, where I see it is, this is in actual fact a uh, evolutionary requirement, and so as much as you and I don't, might not need it nearly as much as we once did, it's still useful, uh, but it, it comes from a space of we have safety in numbers. And so if we go back 5,000 years, 10,000 years, whatever it might be, the more of us, the better. Why? If there's you, I, and eight others, 10 in total, let's say we encounter a tiger or a lion or whatever the, the beast is on your continent. It's going to eat one of us. We know that for sure. Uh, and so if uh, there is 10 of us, we've got one in 10 chance of death and nine in 10 chance of survival. But let's say uh, me, you and eight others, we're all having a conversation and one of you picks up on that I am different in some way. And let's say... I get pushed out of the group because of that difference. Or I'm not able to 
uphold my uh, position in the group, you guys kick me out of the group. So now there's nine people in one group, one person alone, and a lion or a tiger or a beast comes along. Who gets eaten? Mm, isolated one. Absolutely. Me every time. And so there is an evolutionary um, a driving force for us to go out and compare ourselves, right? to make sure that we remain in the group, remain in the clan. We've got to be in the tribe. If I'm out of the tribe, I die. If I get sick, I die. If I get injured, I can't find food, I die. So being alone means death. And so we've got this constant desire to make sure that we are safe. And the only way you can have safety is numbers, right? Mm. Social connections, people. So now I've got this, you know, in the 21st century, uh, evolution hasn't um, uh, shifted or changed or anything like that. The same functions are, are operating and I need to therefore look at what I'm doing and will I fit? Mm. Uh, and that's where the comparisons are made. And so I might not know that I don't fit until I'm in the situation and then I start getting a whole lot of signals or I'm told what's cool, what's trendy, what's not, what I should say, what I shouldn't say. I try and crack a joke. It's either going to go down well and I go, Whew, thank goodness I still fit and people think I'm funny and witty or whatever it might be. Great, I'm in the clan. Or I bomb out and they're like, oh, no. Have I said something bad? Will they still like me? Will they kick me out? Mm. Or will they keep me on? I better make sure I don't say something stupid again. And so now we're hesitating. Should I say this? Should I not? And this is just happening all day, yeah. every day. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually crazy. I, I mean, I can relate to that myself, you know, at, at times, absolutely. I see it in the people around me. Um, and I, I hope just to our point earlier about, you know, having these conversations more rife throughout culture. Hopefully that has... You know, hopefully it serves a role and has some sort of um, add some sort of value anyway, and we can see less of those issues arising. I want to talk a bit more about some of the other challenges that you see presented in your practice. Um, but before we do, I just want to go back to the acceptance piece that we were just talking about um, with uh, with the ACT model. Something that I often tussle with myself is this balance between at what point do you accept something, and I guess. Um, welcome in the peace that would come with, with that level of acceptance vis-a-vis -vis, um, having an impact to, to influence or control something you can control. So for example, I mean, I'm six foot five, foot, but an example where if I was five foot tall and I wanted to play NBA, it might be a, it might be a genuine problem. I might not be able to do it. Um, and there's not a whole lot I can do. So by that accord, acceptance is a pretty good game plan if that's a, creating some sort of emotional turmoil. However, if I'm um, undisciplined, for example, and there's some shame that comes with that, or there's, I don't like the person that I see in the mirror as a result of poor decisions in the past, I can make better decisions. It can be really hard. And there's, and there's reasons why I'm still making those poor ones, but there's some level of agency that I can retain, um, but but that feels like more of a more of an aggressive, more of a um, attacking mindset. Does it, and that's where we come back to that idea of nuance, I suppose. So, is that some of the work that you do, or do you have any thoughts around, um, I guess, separating the two? When's the right time to accept something, and when's the right time to kind of um, change something if you can? Sure. Look, it's incredibly nuanced and uh, there is no answer to that because uh, each one of my clients has to figure that out for themselves. You know, there are certainly things that we can't control. And generally speaking, on a general basis, they're quite useful to try and adopt and accept, come to terms with. Having said that, sometimes there can be a tricky context where let's say someone who's shorter uh, they can't change that they're short so they have to accept that having said that sometimes we have a relational frame which says if you're short you cannot compete now to a degree that's probably valid and to a degree it's not that can be a thought prison so that we can be imprisoned by a thought which says I've got no advantage. I've got to work extra hard. Everyone else is going to get the ball easier or whatever it might be. Or therefore, I might as well not even try. Now, that's kind of like helplessness and hopelessness. It's giving up. I don't know whether someone should use determination. It just depends. You know, mm. is this important 
is this valuable? Do you need to do this so you're living true to yourself? Now, for some people, it's really valuable that they give it their all before they give up so that they can sleep. Mm. Another person, they say, it would be really silly for me to continue on trying. Uh, and so there's wisdom in letting this go earlier. Now, I don't know what the context is. The context is, is what's in the client's mind. And so we, we have a circle of, you know, control. We have a circle of concern. Now, in general, generally speaking, we want to enhance the circle of control. Do what you can that's within your control. And you want to reduce the circle of concern. So, you know, accept, make room for all those things that are outside of your control and are just occurring. But when and how, they're negotiable. And I, I know for myself, I'm a fairly stubborn person. So sometimes uh, I actually get a sense of self or a sense of achievement of not letting go the first time. And it kind of, you know, uh, it fulfills me because in some sense, I'm proud to be hard headed. I'm proud to be stubborn. It's part of who I am. And I believe it served me. Mm. Similarly, I've been hard headed and it hasn't served me. And so now there's a wisdom of range that we go back to, you know, when do I do it and when don't I? Uh, and, you know, that's what ACT is about. You know, is this helpful? Does it serve me? Is it beneficial? Do I have the range that I'm comfortable with doing both mm. rather than I'm leaning so far on one side that it's just easy to continue doing the same thing over and over and over without thinking? Uh, and so yeah, there's just, bit of a dance yeah. going on so it's all in the nuance yeah i think i couldn't agree more and i think that's becoming more and more evident as this conversation goes on we're talking about these different ideas you can see how it's very contextual and having that range is such a good word i'm going to add that to my vocabulary moving forward because it's really powerful and it's funny just hearing you talk about being stubborn i'm very much the same in in some respects and in many cases i've got a great sense of fulfillment and pride and self-worth um, from, from pursuits. And I, you know, whether it's the dopamine surge that comes from chasing after something important to me, but, and that is fantastic, but there is absolutely times where I've just over-indexed and I've, I've felt flat a bit for an array of reasons. And it's, I'm chasing a feeling that I'm not going to get from those things. And there's obviously an opportunity for me to either be accepting of the situation that's holding me back from pursuing at that moment in time, um, and so what I've tried to do uh, in recent times, and I'm far from perfect, and this is what I talk about a lot with this program, is my North Star is no longer trying to build the biggest business. It's no longer trying to, you know, be the funniest. Um, I mean, I like making people laugh, but the North Star is to feel good, right? It's optimal brain chemistry. It's optimal psychology. And I think when more and more people uh, pivot and, and make that the North Star, it makes decision making and strategies a bit easier. And sometimes you're going to be all in on the, you know, the go getter side. Sometimes if your North Star is to feel good, it might send, might make sense for your approach to be, let me relax, let me implement some self-care practices, let me connect with the professional to be able to think out loud and join the dots with where I'm struggling. Um, so I feel like that makes a lot of sense. And I guess then the question becomes, well, what does you know, optimal psychology look like. So for yourself, Nesh, you know, having worked with so many different people over the years, and we'll come back to some of the other uh, problems that, that you see arising in your clinic soon, but optimal psychology, do you have an idea of what that looks like that you can describe or is it, um, is it something that, uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, look, uh, the, the word optimal is really, really hard because it immediately triggers in me, in my mind, uh, you know, what is the right, what is the best. And so the minute I, I hear right or best, at least that's the way my mind converts it, is I go back to psychological flexibility. So to me, it's being able to meet the world as it is in that moment, in that context, and making decisions from that point. Because any other version doesn't take into consideration can context. So even though I can be incredibly stubborn, sometimes I might want to apply that stubbornness to being stubbornly patient. And so that can be incredibly 
helpful or at least a, a, a useful muscle to go out and practice, you know, to, to cultivate. Why? Because I'm going to need to be patient at times. And I don't know what's around the corner. You know, it could be poor health that you know, hits myself or my family or loved ones, friends. And I might need to be you know, patient. I, I might have to be patient with loved ones with, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a parent. It's going to be, I believe, a great utility in being patient. Mm. Similarly, you know, how is that patience? You know, is it stubborn? Is it short lived? It depends on the context as well. So I think when we talk about optimal, it's, it's about being having a presence of mind and awareness, a, a consciousness, you know, a present moment, mindful, you know, it's a bit of a catch word these days, but a mindful uh, um, uh, set, a mindful lens to look at those uh, things that are important, yeah. my value set, what's going on in my life that I can make room for or, or won't tolerate, how I can see the world clearly, whether it's, you know, with this diffusion uh, space and how I identify as a human being to act in accordance with that, which, which will go out and enrich my life. You know, I've got some other ideas that I'm, you know, messing around with, but, you know, in terms of trying to not harm others, uh, being, conscious of other people's viewpoints and respectful of, of, of those, but I'm, I'm tossing them around because I'm not quite sure on an evolutionary state, whether those things actually apply. Um, Cause you know, the, the, there's that story of the, the um, I think it's the Chinese farmer and the horse. Uh, okay. I, I don't know if I messed that up, but if, if you want, I'm, I'm happy to share it. Yeah, please. Briefly. You've got me curious now. So I'm sure people watching and listening want you to it's, follow through. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and please, please, uh, you know, uh, don't quote me on this because I won't get it exactly right. But it's, the, the story kind of goes like this where uh, there's a farmer who has a horse, you know, uh, some, some time ago. And obviously, the, a horse is very prized and important and, you know, brings, brings um, you know, work and, and wealth to the family. And one day he forgets to close the gate and the horse runs off. And the neighbor comes over and says, oh, gosh, so, such bad fortune, such terrible fortune. And the farmer says, maybe. And the next day, the horse returns with two wild horses following it. And the wind closes the gate shut. And the neighbor races over and says, such great fortune. And then farmer says, maybe. The following day, the farmer's son jumps on one of the horses to you know, break it in so it can be you know, used. And the horse bucks him off and he has a terrible fall and breaks his knee in a really, really bad way. And the neighbor comes over and says, such terrible fortune. And the, and the farmer says, maybe. And the following day, there's a knock on the door and there's a man in uniform uh, who says to the farmer, we're here to take all abled men to the front line because the war has broken out. And his son's there with a broken leg and the neighbors come over and say, such great fortune. And the farmer says, maybe. And so you can see that what we're doing is we're not judging. So mm. it's very easy to say, you know, being uh, you know, careless and leaving the door open was bad, you know, and it's easy for me to say, don't harm someone. That's bad. Now I'm not going out and saying to any of your listeners, go out and be harmful. Uh, but I'm, I'm playing with this nuance of, is it actually bad? You know, yeah. can I maybe even accept and reconcile that bad things happen? And maybe, maybe uh, they don't always lead to something bad, mm. uh, you know, cause if we're going to judge bad, then, you know, bad, good, bad, good, right, wrong versus saying this just happened. And how do I reconcile with it? You know, because I don't know, maybe, maybe death isn't bad either. Maybe it's just something that occurs in the cycle of life. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly having that approach, um, it at least makes us, I would think anyway, less emotionally charged or more emotionally sober um, to approach, you know, challenges or opportunities or in any situations probably is the better way because that's neither good nor bad. 
in life, and I think everyone, you know, watching and listening to the program, all of us at some point have had some sort of silver lining in our life, or, you know, sometimes it's small, sometimes it's large. So, I mean, that alone is just, a, I guess, a testament to that idea that something that seems horrible might actually be, you know, might be fruitful in the future. So um, it almost helps, it makes it easier to recognize that right now I don't need to be as emotionally invested um if particularly if it's in a situation particularly if the net result is some sort of psychological turmoil um you know and i imagine you it, particularly if that's consistent over a lifetime you know you start rewiring neural pathways it, i can see how it's I, I and i'm just i'm almost just hypothesizing and guessing here so i'd love to get your thoughts on this how it becomes easy if to to almost create yeah, our own state or our, our own temperament or our own um issues um, and then obviously as arising from that as symptoms, you know, like anxiety and depression and these things off the back of, I mean, there's many factors of course, but that's just one where maybe it's just a pattern of, um, emo- emotional turmoil. I hope that makes sense. So, um, is that something that you say where there's a, a real pattern of poor thinking that then leads to, I guess, um, some of the symptoms that you have to explore or is it, uh, is there a, Yeah. Yeah, look, absolutely. You know, so much of this can be, in in some sense, boiled down to the way that we relate with life. Now, whether it's things that are happening external to us, things that are happening internal, you know, that internal and external locus of control, expectations, judgments, you know, the internal criticisms that we have, particularly around, you know, what, what what's going on for us. This is all a, a relational experience. And so if I don't like being inside my skin or what's happening inside me, you know, that's the greatest um, uh, battle that I'll ever face. You know, something, uh, something that I did as a young, young, well, younger man, um, I was a young man, I suppose, at, at the time is, and I still feel uncomfortable, by the way, I feel uncomfortable having this conversation with you. I, I have so many nerves, you know, on a public level. Um, having said that, this still comes to me a lot easier than, you know, being an academic. So I like talking with people, even though it makes me nervous. What I did as a young man is I went out and got myself a job that was uh, uh, telemarketing. And I didn't get my job you know, to be a telemarketer because I needed uh, the money at the time. Um, I went out because I knew I hated feeling uh, bound up, tight, uncomfortable. You might even call it anxious, right? Or you know, nervous. And so I did that job and I rang, I think our quota was, you know, we had to make 40 phone calls an hour. And when you do that over and over and over again, trying to sell something, you get a lot of um, kind Australians not being so kind. And, you know, they would say all sorts of things to you and you've got to, you know, this word, you've got to cultivate, you know, you've got to develop a way to sit with that. And it doesn't mean a thick skin, right? It means a way with sitting with, you know, with holding these thoughts. Now, I don't know, everyone's got a different idea. Some person might say, uh, you know, they're just frustrated because it's something about their own life. Another person might say, you know, uh, I'm not going to let it hurt me because I'm here just doing a job. There's nothing wrong with doing a job. Everyone's got a different way. I think it's useful to have many ways, right? And, 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 and to kind of examine why do I feel this way? What is it that gets to me? Is it just my feelings? It's the thoughts that's, that, 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 that's connected and like. After I did that job for a period, I quit and I became a door knocking person where I'd knock on people's doors and tell them to come over to our latest greatest plan of of a you know new telephone um you know subscription uh, and as you can imagine it gets a little bit more real when someone's telling you to bugger off in your face and you've had to knock on their door or on their home uh, it's quite intrusive and awful so i did that for a period as well what that means is that i no longer have a worry or concern about picking up a phone that says unknown number because i'm not afraid of it and what's fascinating to me is that people are still stuck there, right? And I get it. I make it makes sense. But a lot of people say, I'm not going to pick it up. You know, if it's important, they'll call me back. Oh, I don't know who's calling me. What, what is it that they, they, they would want? And it's even this hangover where people might think, oh, it's probably a telemarketer. When was the last time you got a telemarketing phone call on your phone? I mean, it, mm. 
it's fairly non-existent because it no longer works, right? People are no longer suckered into it. Um, but you have these sort of comments and it's fascinating. So, you know, I think what people present with is, is their experience inside their skin. Mm. Uh, and really psychology is about cultivating, firstly, understanding the problem, you know, from, from you know, those, those, those six core processes of, of, of the ACT framework, but also then cultivating an, an approach around range. How can I be more psychologically flexible so that I can see what's going on? And if it's a real bother, if it's causing me lots of grief and, and, and steering me in a direction away from what's important, can I do something about it? And it might mean a bit of practice. Now, now it doesn't need to be exactly how I, you know, I, I'm a bit of an um, extremist. So I like to throw myself at things. It can be a lot gentler. It can be a lot more, um, uh, you know, slow exposure and kind of bringing, bringing your tolerance levels up, or not tolerance, being acceptance, you know, and, and, and uh, openness position up uh, rather than you know, uh, uh, yeah, this ongoing avoidance that you know, is impulsive or um, you know, unsure about what direction it's taking. So, yeah, I hope that kind of explains. Yeah, for sure. Um, it does a bit, mate. It does. It's really interesting. And I feel like we could just riff on ideas for hours. Um, you know, you've joked that you, you love this stuff. Well, so do I, you know, unfortunately I don't have anywhere near the expertise that you do, but um, I'm just as excited to be able to chat like this and connect with people like you. I've got two more for you, Nash. Just want to be really respectful of your time um, that I wanted to, I guess, throw at you and, and get your thoughts around. Um, the first of which is just the unprecedented situation we're all facing right now, particularly Melbournians, you know, uh, throughout this COVID-19 um, pandemic. Have you seen any new um, sort of psychological uh, problems arising or is it, or is it more of the same that's essentially been exacerbated as a result of, you know, whether it's loneliness um, or uh, anxiety or ambiguity around the future? What have you seen from a psychological point of view, um, the impact of the coronavirus? Sure, look, for, for, from, from my experience, and obviously I'm not speaking for, for everyone, uh, and appreciating that I live in Canberra and Canberra has been fairly um, uh, uh, less affected than many other regions, you know, for example, Melburnians, people around the world. Uh, a couple of things have come out. I haven't seen too much change, you know, but I, I think the great difficulty, the, the two great places that I think uh, most people have, or the patterns that I've seen is obviously isolation. Mm. Human beings are not good in isolation. This is why we know when there is severe isolation, we see an increase in mental health difficulties, challenges and the like. And a, you know, a very, very obvious um, example of this is when someone's put into solitary confinement. Um, and obviously there's, there's also you know, uh, a deprivation of stimulus that goes along with that. Well, in some sense, being locked up in your own home you know, for extended periods of time does create a level of deprivation from all the things that you would usually be experiencing. And so I think the mind can play some tricks on us and we can get, you know, uh, entangled with thoughts and you know, it, 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 it kind of is, is circular. So I think that's, uh, that's you know, a significant one in, in the isolation. The other one is, is just change. Mm. Human beings struggle with change you know and it's, it's fascinating because a lot of people to start with you know would, would uh and not i'm not certainly not speaking for everyone but a lot of people were against working from home you know they, they were saying this is wrong you know you can't do your job you know it's inefficient it's ineffective etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. well we're going to reach a stage and many have where they're being asked to go back to work and what do you think happens at that point? The mind gets involved and says, we can't expect us to go back to work. Why do I need to? You know, working from home is just as effective and it gives me all this other flexibility. So we end up arguing whatever position we're in because we like things to be stable. We don't like change. And in there creates a lot of the problems. So uncertainty yeah. has been painful. And coronavirus has created uncertainty so it's hard to adapt to being at home or going back or in between what's it going to be like tomorrow yeah you know what what can i hold that's stable and so i think covid has created 
isolation and that instability, that uncertainty. And they're the two big challenges that I've, I've seen in my practice. I see that too. Um, and just on change really quickly, Ness, uh, Ness, is that something that you see presented in your, in your practice where people are coming to you with issues, um, you know, psychological traumas or, or things that they're having to deal with and struggling with, but there's an attachment, even though it's not good, there's an attachment to it. And there's a hesitancy to change because of the, whatever that weird desire is to be um, the same. Is that, is that kind of a set, an additional problem for people looking to move through something or move past something is that they're so familiar with it that um, they're also scared of change. It's kind of this double-edged sword. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think when we hold any concept tightly, whether it's the concept of uh, regularity, you know, when that changes, it creates new questions. And the mind loves this um, fertilized ground to ask a whole lot of questions. I mean, there, there are people who, let's say, have been going through uh, a relationship strain, you know, or breakdown, or they were hurt in the past. And even though they could for years feel really upset about something, they might actually obtain a, an apology, someone making amends. Now, it wouldn't be strange in my work to hear someone upset about obtaining an apology. Now, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong, nor good, nor bad. It's just watching a pattern. Now, some people might say that's a welcome apology, and I'm very thankful. Another person might get to that stage, but first go through upset of, well, why couldn't they apologize earlier? I'm sick and tired of people going out and uh, treating me this way. Shouldn't have even happened in the first place. And they're more upset about obtaining an apology than they were a week ago when they didn't get an apology. And I'm not saying that everyone needs to be happy with an apology and immediately adopt it, accept it, but we can see fusion. We can see where the thing that someone wants sometimes get and then they're upset by it. And, and that's nothing wrong with that. That's as, as a matter of fact, exactly what we want. We want to say, let's embrace all the feelings because that's a part of the process of you know, getting through you know, what we might call, you know, grief or loss or hurt or, you know, disappointment. But we've got to really start examining what is it that's going on inside me that still makes me upset or what is it that allows me to kind of sit with it. So, you know, I live in Canberra and every time I go to Sydney, because it's closer than Melbourne, every time I go to Sydney, I wrestle with traffic. You know, even though I'm practicing this stuff all the time and I love it, when I get to Sydney, I get into a wrestling match, you know, and my wife would have, you know, would, would certainly attest to this that, you know, I'm like, I'm feeling tense, I'm more agitated, you know, I'm feeling more irritable. Yet I can kind of sit in Canberra traffic, you know, I've got a, an acceptance space there. But the minute we get to Sydney, you know, we start moving to Campbelltown. We're not even in Sydney and we're approaching. I'm like, look at all this traffic. Where, you know, how can people live here? And you know, I start carrying on. So <laughs> you know, we're all, we're all human very much so and we don't want to go out and you know, be judgmental and critical but rather a bit more compassionate a bit more understanding in actual fact even a bit playful you know we, we've got to yeah. be able to laugh at ourselves so that we can go out and highlight some of those you know shortcomings and therefore do something about them or at, at a bare minimum maybe even just accept those two yeah and i think just as a, as a nice sort of byproduct you know just being playful and and a little bit lighthearted at times. It just it seems to add towards that north star of just of you know good psychology, whatever that whatever that looks like or um, you know entails. It's only a good thing to be playful and you know to laugh and um, it, it enhances the psycholo the the psychological range we've been talking about throughout this conversation, right? So one more, I just want to sneak in before I let you go, Nesh. Um, and I feel like this is a dangerous question because we could talk about this for hours and hours, but it's the age old ultimatum of nature versus nurture. And I suppose for someone like yourself, you know, you've got a lot of experience one-on-one -on -one with, with clients. Um, I know you do a lot of these conversations. So have you got any thoughts around what the balance is? Like, is there some, is there a, uh, a nature part, which is quote unquote hardwired? And, you know, we know the example of the person 
and I well, I'm just speaking from my own experience where it's, uh, it, I am the way I am. I am, I'm born this way or what have you, you know, we could, and again, we could go down that rabbit hole, but uh, how much truth is there to that? versus how much of it is environment, whether it's childhood and then how much can be changed. Like I said, it's, it's a loaded question. Um, but no, I like general. them. I like them. Yeah. <laughs> Look, it, it, is, it is a dangerous uh, a question because we could go on, on for hours. Look, nature and nurture, the way that I look at it is the science, I think, is fairly well uh, established. There is both. We know that. And it's not really a question of one or the other. It's one and the other. I don't actually even think it's a question of how much in this context versus that context, because first of all, we can't measure it. So let's accept that in the first place. Uh, we know that there are lots of things that nature goes out and provides us. Yeah. I don't think there are too many psychologists out there that it will argue, you know, the, the, the big five personality traits. Yeah. They're fairly stable over time. We can see that they're fairly well established from basically birth. Psychologists have done lots of examples, you know, that, that have demonstrated biases that are built in that are fairly well predictive of, um, you know, certain ways of behavior. For example, the marshmallow experiment, putting a marshmallow in front of a, a four-year-old and think about this as a four-year-old, right? my, my, my daughter's just about to turn four. So I'm about to do this experiment with her, <laughs> but you put a marshmallow in front of a four-year-old and you say, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave the room and I'll come back in 10 minutes. If you haven't eaten it, you'll get an extra marshmallow and you leave the room. Now there, there are temperaments that, that are around. Some children will grab it and before you've even closed the door of the room, they've already hoovered it into their mouth. <laughs> they've just eaten it and they love it and they, they are geared that way. Another kid will look at it and they'll push it around and they're not allowed to move, they'll leave, leave the chair. They'll push it around, they might smell it, they might even lick it, they might stand, uh, sit on their hands. All sorts of things to try and somehow sit with the discomfort of not being able to eat it. Right? And they've got that available at four years old, right? Experiment comes in, they get two, they've got delayed gratification. And, you know, some of that is correlated with obviously how long a child uh, or young person might sit with difficult academia and, you know, how, how they might perform. That's just one small example. Uh, but what we see is, uh, I don't know uh, about you or any of your less listeners, whether they've got kids or not, but anyone that's met a four-year-old, you cannot change their temperament, right? Because you can't even reason with them. Mm. So this has all happened. Nature has provided this. And then we've got plenty of nurture. I mean, this is why parenting is such an important part of any upbringing. As a matter of fact, if you look at evolution, evolution says, please allow there to be parents. Parents need to raise young. The, the young, you know, for, for, you know, us as mammals, Geez, we're dependent for a bloody long time. You know, we're useless for such a long period of time and it, it takes so long to provide those lessons. So we absorb and th this is called the nurture. And every context is different. You know, what we're really asking is how willing are you to go out and exploit the nurture part uh, if it's important to you mm. of the way that we're designed. So I don't have to be ransom to not being able to talk to someone on the phone or knock on a door or walk into a cafe and, and, and feel anxious and therefore avoid cafes. No, no, I can go out and I can actively put myself in these situations where I can then sit with it. As a matter of fact, I might even laugh about my own temperament. So I don't go out and get so concerned about it. As a matter of fact, me even just tabling it here is yet another example of how I sit with discomfort. So nature, nurture, we don't know the percentages. To tell you the truth, who cares? If there's something you can do about it, do it. You know, this is how medicine follows, uh, follows um, research as well. We don't go out and say, is this in your biology that you get cancer? We say, we don't really care how you get it. Let's treat it. Yeah. Right. Whether it's biologically 
for example, you know, a young person with, you know, a, a severe, you know, uh, brain cancer, which is awful, uh, or whether it's an old person with severe brain cancer, we still go out and uh, we say this is an aggressive form of cancer. Let's do everything that we can to do something about this. And so psychology does the same. We say, we don't care where this comes from. You might have a particular temperament or a particular understanding of the world. Let's challenge it. Um, at least, at least take another perspective, some some ver variability in, in in perspective, so that we can decision make better, and therefore act on those decisions better. Rinse, repeat, do that over and over and over again, and that's basically the recipe of evolution. So, nature, nurture. I don't think it matters. Man, it's one of the better um, better uh, summaries of that of that question, and a really good lens to look at it through uh, and look at life through. Um, and again, a perfect way to finish. Uh, really encapsulating that idea of, of having range and having nuance. Um, and I, I believe in that aggressively. So it's great to hear someone in your professional shoes share the same sort of thoughts. So, um, mate, for people listening and watching, if they want to learn more about you, uh, where can they connect with you? Uh, are you online? Are you, I know you're on YouTube. I mentioned a couple of times. Where can we find you? Well, I try and make myself available anywhere. So reach out in any 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 form you like. You, you can get uh, uh, get in touch through my practice, which is strategicpsychology.com.au. We're in Canberra. Uh, I have a website, neshnicklick.com. There's a YouTube channel under Neshnicklick as well. Uh, Facebook, wherever. Um, you know, things most of these things. I'm I'm not I'm not uh, uh, overly um, proficient at, at any of them, but. I, I go ahead and put it out there. I just think that psychology and you know ACT in particular has has um, uh, a lot to 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 do to stimulate thought, conversation. Hence, why you know appreciate you you are inviting me onto the show as well because uh, it's a good good place to to have that conversation and um, you know, learn more. Mate, I agree. I agree. Well, I appreciate you making the time. I learned heaps, which is always. You know, one of my priorities uh, from a selfish point of view, but then as a byproduct, I'm sure people who are connecting with this program will, will have learned heaps as well. So yeah, once again, appreciate you making the time, Nesh. Liam, appreciate it.